Identifying hypoglycemia early can save a life and it is really easy to do. This is Dr. Madeleine Muller, family physician working at Nkobela TB Hospital in Ndansani in the Eastern Cape. This presentation is a guide on the identification and management of hypoglycemia in patients with tuberculosis. At Nkobela Hospital, we have identified hypoglycemia as an important condition to be aware of for two reasons. Firstly, we have observed that many of our very ill patients with TB have episodes of hypoglycemia. Unfortunately, many patients with TB still wait too long to access treatment and are suffering from severe weight loss by the time they seek care, with some weighing as little as 40 kilograms. In the olden days, TB was actually known as consumption, with dramatic weight loss one of its key features. Energy is used both by the TB bacilli as well as the body fighting the infection. As a result, the disease process itself uses up all of the body's food till it eventually consumes the body itself. Patients with severe malnutrition, especially with a BMI of under 18.5, are at a risk of blood sugars falling below safe levels. The second reason for this protocol is that hypoglycemia has huge implications. The brain's main fuel is sugar, and when sugar levels fall too low, the brain shuts down. In severe hypoglycemia, the patient will collapse into a coma, and if the sugar is not corrected within a few minutes, permanent brain damage is inevitable. Although hypoglycemia is relatively easy to pick up and treat, time is of its essence, and at our hospital we aim to ensure that hypoglycemia is picked up early and managed quickly. Probably the most important part of this protocol is recognizing hypoglycemia. If we can identify it before the patient loses consciousness, we can quickly correct it. As the blood sugar level starts to drop, patients can present in a many different ways. Early on, they can have any of the following. They might feel dizzy, or really, really tired. They might complain of a headache, or of sweating. They might feel shaky, or have a very fast high heartbeat, or even just say that they're feeling anxious. When the sugar drops even further, you might find more severe symptoms. They might act strangely, uh, get uncooperative, become confused or aggressive, or most worryingly, have a reduced or complete loss of consciousness. Any of these symptoms or any change in condition warrants a quick blood glucose test. All of our wards have point of care blood glucometers and it's very easy to take a reading. One point of warning. If a patient is very shocked or shut down with poor peripheral circulation, then a fingertip glucose test may show a pseudo hypoglycemia with the blood sugar showing much lower on the test than it actually is, but more on this later. The next question is when is a blood sugar too low? Any reading under 3.5 millimoles per liters needs intervention and if the patient is symptomatic that intervention is urgent. Hypoglycemia is a medical emergency which means that you don't walk to the emergency trolley, you run. The treatment of hypoglycemia is very simple. All you need to do is get sugar into your patient. If the patient is awake and able to swallow, the oral route is the quickest and the most efficient. Mix five teaspoons of sugar or glucose powder into a cup of water. This will make a 10% sugar solution, which you can help your patient to drink. Wait five minutes and ask the patient how they are feeling. If they're still not 100%, feel free to repeat and in the meantime, get the patient something to eat. The real challenge comes if your patient is unconscious or so confused or weak that they are unable to drink the oral solution. At this point, an IV injection of dextrose is your best option. Remember the time is of the essence, so if you have an unconscious patient and the blood glucose test is low, you want that sugar on board within 5 minutes. The sooner, the better. We are going to give the patient 20 ml of 50% dextrose and there should be at least a couple of ampules in your emergency trolley. Monitor the clinical response, and if the level of consciousness is not improving significantly within a few minutes, give another 20 ml of 50% dextrose. A few important points at this time. First, dextrose solution is a thick and sticky substance, 
To save time, it is quicker to draw it up with a syringe without the needle. Secondly, give the dextrose directly into one of the big veins, for example, the brachial vein in the crook of the arm, or if you have the skill, even femorally. Although an IVI line must also be inserted, do not waste time trying to find a vein on a hand for this first bolus dose of dextrose. Perhaps one of colleague can start looking for a vein while another administers the 50% dextrose. Thirdly, it is sensible to always flush the vein with saline following the dextrose draw solution. This will reduce the risk of the sticky substance sclerosizing the vein. But what if it's late at night? You are the only professional on duty and you're unable to get a vein. You've already reported the emergency to your senior doctor, but he or she might still be 10 or 20 minutes away. You have two other options, but these must only be considered as a last resort. The first is to give the patient one milligram of glucagon subcutaneously or intramuscularly. There's a glucagon in all the emergency trolleys. Glucagon works by releasing glucose from the body's existing glucose stores. Unfortunately, this may not be very effective in severely malnourished patients as they may not have any stores to draw from. The second option is to insert a nasogastric tube and to give 200 moles of 10% dextrose through the tube or even 5 teaspoons of sugar mixed with 200 moles of water. This can be repeated until the sugar level recovers. A couple of tips with that. If the patient is unconscious, it's best to insert the nasogastric tube while they're lying on their side to reduce the risk of aspiration and to get it more easily past the back of the tongue. Remember to test with the pH to make sure that you've placed the tube in the correct place. As the patient starts to recover and look better, you can monitor the blood glucose every 10 to 20 minutes until it is consistently over 4.5 millimoles per litre. Get that IV line up and give one liter of 10% dextrose over three to four hours. In very malnourished patients, you can also add an ampule of 100 milligrams of thiamine to the bag. Remember the pseudoglycemia I mentioned earlier? If your patient is looking much better, but the blood glucose readings are still very low, it may be that he's so peripherally shut down that you're getting a false low reading. Test a blood sample from higher up the arm if your readings are not making any sense. Once the patient is stable, you can do the blood glucose every four to six hours. Great, you have saved your patient's life, but the work is not yet finished. We now have to try and establish the cause of the hypoglycemia to reduce the risk of any further events. At our hospital, we have noticed that hypoglycemia in our patients are multifactorial. Most of the patients with episodic hypoglycemia are severely malnourished due to the tuberculosis and their body nutritional stores have been completely depleted. The biggest risk is in the first month of starting TB treatment. It is postulated that as the TB bacillary load reduces, the resulting strengthened immune system responds with an increased inflammatory response. This requires more energy and many of our patients lose weight and even have worsened night sweats before they start to improve. Patients with advanced TB are often weak and may not be eating adequately. All of these factors are further compounded in a patient who have underlying HIV. Careful weight monitoring and management is essential. A dietitian is a key part of the team to ensure that the patient with poor appetite has adequate nutritional supplementation that provides 500 to 1,000 extra calories a day. This could be enriched soy or nut butters, porridges or supplementary drinks. Amasi is an excellent high protein source of additional calories. It is essential to have an up-to-date bedside food chart to keep track of how much the patient is eating and very weak patients may have to be spoon fed every two to three hours throughout the day but other factors may compound the underlying malnutrition. It's important to screen for and manage any sepsis a patient might have and to look for underlying conditions such as renal or liver abnormalities. If the patient has diabetes, it's important to take a careful history. As patients with diabetes lose weight, they may require less medication and can start having episodes of hypoglycemia. Medication must be adjusted accordingly and diet revised. 
It is also possible that some of the medication that we are using to treat the tuberculosis can also have hypoglycemia as a complication. One would only consider adjusting medication when the hypoglycemia proves refractory as we do not want to compromise the TB regimen unnecessarily. Medicines we use that have been implicated are the fluoroquinolones, high-dose cotrimoxazole as well as linezolid, much more uncommonly enalapril and sometimes rifampicin, fluconazole in combination with glabenclamide um, or glamepramide could further complicate your diabetic care. Very rarely some of the first-line TB drugs such as INH can cause an immune-mediated hypoglycemia called anti-tuberculosis treatment insulin autoimmune syndrome. It is essential to first address malnutrition and the other factors before changing the patient's script as these complications are very rare. We are continuously exploring ways to prevent severe hypoglycemia attacks in patients admitted with tuberculosis. We are currently doing a fasting blood glucose on all our patients with a BMI of under 18.5, as well as patients with marked weight loss or patients who are bedridden. In patients where the morning blood sugar is consistently less than 4 millimoles per litre, our dietitian designs eating plans and supplements to increase the nutritional intake. We are hoping that this prevents severe hypoglycemic attacks needing acute intervention. Hypoglycemia is easy to diagnose and easy to treat, and an aggressive approach could reduce both mortality and morbidity when managing patients with advanced tuberculosis in an inpatient setting. Please pass this information on to other clinicians passionate about improving care for patients in their facilities with tuberculosis. Thank you.